Huh, did you know that the Pacific Ocean is so large? It's bigger than all the Earth's land area combined? Yes, you heard it right. The Pacific, a mesmerizing expanse of water, reaches over 60 million square miles. That's more than double the size of the world's second largest ocean, the Atlantic. Try to imagine that for a moment. It's like fitting two Atlantic oceans and you would still have room to spare. Its depth is another story. The Pacific holds the record for being the deepest, with the Mariana Trench plunging more than seven miles below the surface, and the number of islands it contains, more than 25,000. That's more islands than days in a lifetime. The Pacific is so vast that it contains more than half of the free water on Earth, making it an ocean of superlatives. With such an expanse, it's no wonder that flying over the Pacific Ocean poses some unique challenges. Ever heard of the Great Circle Route? It might not be what you think. The Great Circle Route isn't a specific path marked on a map, nor is it a hidden airway only known to pilots. Rather, it's a concept rooted in geometry. Imagine a globe. If you were to draw a line between two points on that globe, the shortest distance isn't a straight line like you'd expect on a flat surface. Instead, it's a curve that traces the surface of the sphere. This curve is the Great Circle Route. It's a bit like peeling an orange. If you were to cut the peel in a straight line from top to bottom, you'd have a curved piece of orange peel. That's essentially what we're looking at when we're talking about the Great Circle Route. So how does this relate to flight paths? Well, airplanes operate in a three-dimensional world. They're not confined to a flat map, but rather the curved surface of our planet. When planning a flight, pilots and air traffic controllers aim to plot the shortest route, which on a sphere is a great circle route. Now, when you're looking at this route on a flat map, it can look like the plane is taking a longer curved path. This can lead to misconceptions that planes are intentionally avoiding certain areas or taking unnecessarily long routes. But in reality, they're following the shortest possible path on a sphere. Think about it this way. When you're driving, you don't always take the straightest path because roads curve and wind. You take the shortest path that the roads allow. The same principle applies to planes, but on a much larger scale. So when you see planes seemingly avoiding the vast Pacific Ocean on a map, it's not because they're taking the scenic route. They're actually following the Great Circle Route, which, due to the Earth's curvature, may seem like a longer path on a flat map. So while it may seem like planes avoid the Pacific, they're actually following the shortest possible route. The letters E-T-O-P-S can make a huge difference in how a plane crosses the Pacific. These five letters stand for Extended Range Twin Engine Operational Performance Standards. But what does that mean? And why is it so crucial for Trans-Pacific flights? Well, ETOPS regulations are essentially rules that determine how far a twin engine airplane can stray from an alternate airport. The distance that an aircraft is allowed to fly from an alternate airport is directly proportional to the amount of time the aircraft can fly with only one engine functioning, its single engine flying time. For instance, ETOPS 120 regulations allow a twin engine airplane to fly on a route that is up to 120 minutes flying time from the nearest suitable airport. Similarly, ETOPS 180 allows a plane to fly up to 180 minutes from the nearest airport. Now, why does this matter when flying over the Pacific Ocean? Well, the Pacific is the largest and deepest ocean on Earth, which means there are vast expanses of water with no alternate airports in sight. This scarcity of airports makes the Pacific Ocean a challenging area for twin-engine planes to navigate. If a plane is only certified for ETOPS 120, it must plan a route that keeps it within 120 minutes of an airport at all times. This could mean that the plane has to take a more circuitous route potentially flying closer to land and further from the most direct path across the Pacific. However, if a plane is certified for ETOP S-330, it can fly almost directly across the Pacific, as it is allowed to be as much as five and a half hours from the nearest suitable airport. Therefore, the ETOP certification that a plane has can significantly influence its possible flight paths. The higher the ETOPS certification, the more direct and, therefore, more efficient a route the plane can take. So, ETOPS regulations are a key factor in determining whether a plane can cross the Pacific directly. Sometimes, it's not just about the shortest route, but also about fuel efficiency and passenger comfort. Let's dive into the intricacies of flight planning. When charting a course across the vast expanse of the Pacific Ocean, airlines don't simply draw a straight line from point A to point B. They must take into account a number of factors, including fuel efficiency and the comfort of their passengers. To start, wind patterns play a crucial role. 
Earth's atmosphere is a swirling tapestry of air currents with powerful jet streams that can both aid and hinder a flight's progress. Picture this, you're flying from Los Angeles to Tokyo. If the jet stream is in your favor, you might ride its tailwind and save fuel, trimming precious dollars off the flight's operating cost. However, if you're flying against it, the plane will have to work harder and burn more fuel to reach its destination. Now, on to passenger comfort. While it might sound exciting to be tossed around by the unpredictable forces of nature, the reality is far less thrilling. Turbulence, particularly over the Pacific Ocean, can turn a relaxing flight into a white-knuckle ride. It's not just about spilled drinks and unsettled stomachs. Severe turbulence can pose a safety risk. To mitigate this, airlines often choose flight paths that avoid areas known for regular turbulence. They also have meteorologists on hand to provide real-time updates on wind patterns and atmospheric conditions. This way, the flight crew can make necessary adjustments to the route, ensuring you reach your destination with minimal bumps along the way. But it's not as simple as avoiding all turbulence and riding the winds. Airlines also have to consider factors such as air traffic, restricted airspace, and the availability of suitable airports for emergency landings. So, it's a balancing act between the shortest route, fuel efficiency, and ensuring a smooth ride. Every decision made in the flight planning stage is a calculated move to ensure that your journey across the Pacific is as comfortable, safe, and efficient as possible. So, why don't planes fly over the Pacific Ocean? Let's recap. We've discussed the Pacific Ocean's sheer vastness, an expanse of water that dwarfs all the planet's landmasses combined. It's awe-inspiring and humbling, but for aviation, it presents a unique set of challenges. To cross such an enormous body of water, aircraft would need to carry an immense amount of fuel, which is both costly and impractical. Moreover, the lack of landing spots in case of an emergency adds an additional layer of complexity, making flying directly over the Pacific Ocean a less favored option. We also explored the concept of the Great Circle Route, the shortest distance between two points on a sphere. This route often curves northward, making it appear as though planes are avoiding the Pacific. However, they're actually following the most direct path, one that's shaped by the Earth's curvature. So when you see a flight path arching over the Arctic, it's not detouring unnecessarily. It's simply following the curve of our planet, which can sometimes be a bit hard to grasp when looking at a flat map. Then we dove into the world of ETOPS regulations, an acronym that stands for Extended Range Twin Engine Operational Performance Standards. These are rules set by aviation authorities that dictate how far a twin-engine aircraft can fly from the nearest suitable airport for emergency landings. These regulations, while ensuring passenger safety, limit the routes that planes can take, particularly when flying over large bodies of water like the Pacific. We also touched upon other factors such as wind patterns, fuel efficiency, and passenger comfort. Wind patterns play a significant role in determining flight routes. Tailwinds can help planes move faster and consume less fuel, while headwinds can slow aircraft down, increasing fuel consumption. Therefore, pilots often choose flight paths that take advantage of favorable wind conditions, even if that means flying a bit longer. Fuel efficiency is another crucial factor. As we mentioned earlier, carrying extra fuel to cross the entire Pacific Ocean is not only expensive but also increases the plane's weight, which in turn increases fuel consumption. It's a vicious cycle that airlines are keen to avoid. And let's not forget passenger comfort. Long overwater flights can be unnerving for some passengers. By flying closer to land, airlines can help alleviate some of these concerns. In conclusion, there's no single reason why planes don't fly directly over the Pacific Ocean. Instead, it's a combination of factors, from the practicalities of fuel efficiency and the principles of the Great Circle Route, to the safety measures outlined in ETOPS regulations, and the subtle influences of wind patterns and passenger comfort. So, while it may seem like planes are avoiding the Pacific, they're actually using a combination of factors to choose the best route for each specific flight.